exciting. Why are you laughing? It's true. Land use is very exciting. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. We got the rafters full, so I figured we'd make sure that everyone's engaged. Uh, my name is Sean Nolan. I'm the dean, sorry, the associate dean of academic affairs here at Vermont Law School. I'd like to welcome you all to this wonderful event. Um, as you know, Vermont Law School uh, dabbles in environmental law. Uh, we have a little bit of reputation in it. We pride ourselves in some of the work we do in it. Um, and this is one of the things that I enjoy most about the year because this is the moment where I think one of the more significant areas of environmental law gets to be showcased, which is land use law. Land use law, for those of you who don't, don't know, is basically everything else that isn't a federal or state environmental statute. Right? So if you don't deal with it with a federal or state environmental statute, you deal with it with land use. I know, that's shocking. That's silence, right? You can hear a pin drop. So uh, what does that mean? Land use is, uh, land use can address uh, where you put buildings, obviously. It can address where you put roads. It can address what types of resources you protect. It can protect, uh, or it can, it can address employment patterns in your community. It can address housing patterns. Are you gonna design your community so that you're spread out and there's lots of space in between your houses and you have spaces to farm and engage in forestry, or are you gonna design your community so that it's compact and tight and people can walk around and you've got a bunch of mixed uses together, or are you gonna design your community so you have both? You've got urban centers and then you've got rural areas where you can farm. Uh, these are all the questions that we ask with land use. Um, and what we're gonna to do tonight is we're gonna look at another level of land use, which is not just how it is that we sprawl out on the land, but also how it is that we mix together. Um, I discovered the work of Dean Mitchell right now. Uh, he's reluctantly, <laughs> Professor Mitchell, soon to be Professor Mitchell again, uh, and some of his other colleagues that have uh, pushed the envelope in terms of what it is that land use should and could look at, and it's inspiring for me in my future scholarship. So uh, it's, it's a distinct pleasure for me to kick off the Norm Williams lecture. Uh, my job is to hand the podium off to David Mears, Dean David Mears, uh, and I'm now ready to do that. So, uh, oh, oh, you know what, oh, sorry, 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 wait, wait, I forgot one thing I had to do. <laughs> the first thing I had to do was talk about the Norm Williams lecture. Second, I had to introduce Dean Mears. Dean Mears has been at Vermont Law School on and off for in a variety of different forms as a student, as a clinical professor, as a professor, as a dean. Uh, and in between those times when he was serving this wonderful institution, he was doing tremendous service for governments uh, all around the United States, uh, Texas, Washington, Vermont, federal? and some federal work, right? So uh, David has had his fingers in all the different types of environmental work, uh, and it's a pleasure to have him here. It's, I love working with him. Uh, when I, one thing I'll just say before I'll hand it off to him, when I started here 10 years ago, he was the director of the environmental clinic, and I came in as the director of the dispute resolution clinic, and he said, you know, we're litigating all sorts of environmental cases, but we need to teach our clinicians how to negotiate, so will you come in and teach us how to negotiate, and so I came in and did a class, and then the next year I did two classes, and then the next year I didn't do any, so I guess I messed it up. So, yeah. With that, David Mears, thank you. Thank you for that kind introduction, Dean Nolan. I have to say, um, there's a very different energy in the room tonight than the last time I was on this stage. Uh, <laughs> I'll, ex I'll explain later. Um, it's, uh, it's really my distinct pleasure to, to kick off the Norman Williams lecture. And I, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Professor Norman Williams, who I had the great pleasure of having as a law professor so many years ago. Um, uh, he was a, a key figure in the history of land use law um, and land use planning in particular. Um, and he's also played a, a major role in this law school and, and in the formation of the environmental law program. He first came to Vermont back in 1975 
He'd had, before that, a very long and distinguished career as a land use planner and a lawyer in New York State and New Jersey. Um, he started as a zoning analyst in New York City after graduating Yale Law School back in 1943. He was the director and then chief of planning in the, in the, in the city from 1950 to 1960. Uh, he played notably, uh, he played a, an important role, a lead role, in New Jersey's pioneering Mount Laurel decision. Uh, those of you who are students of land use and property law will know how important that law was in striking down exclusionary zoning in New Jersey. And it's a decision that's been uh, reaffirmed in New Jersey multiple times and in a variety of ways, and way, ways that have been really critical to fair housing legislation um, and even in the area of education. He's worked as a scholar and a teacher at Rutgers and Yale. He published a multi-treatise, uh, uh, a multi-volume treatise called American Land Use Planning, uh, first published in 1974 and still being published. And as I noted, he played an important role in the founding of the Environmental Law Center here at Vermont Law School. He was active here as a teacher and as a member of the faculty and the intellectual life of this place until he left in 1995. Um, I can tell you that uh, as his student, that he was deeply committed to the use of the law to make a difference in people's lives. He was deeply committed to the intersection between social justice and land use law. Um, I can also tell you that, I, I have a prop, that he was absolutely terrifying as a professor. Um, this is not a treatise. This is the case book, it's plural that we had to read in a three credit, one semester land use class. <laughs> Professor Williams did not believe in excerpting cases. He believed that students should be held to read all of them and that if we were gonna grow up and be lawyers, we need to learn how to do that. Uh, I'm looking at Professor Parento, who I think also shares that philosophy. <laughs> um, but as terrifying as he was, um, I appreciated that as his student. He made the law relevant, he made it important, he demanded of us that we engage with the same level of in interest, passion, and energy that he brought to the law. And so it is in that spirit uh, my great pleasure to introduce our speaker to you today who also embodies those same values, someone who's deeply committed to the use of law to make a difference in people's lives, someone who's deeply committed to training students to become the next generation of leaders and problem solvers. Um, I'll, let me tell you a little bit about um, Professor Williams' background, Professor Mitchell's background. My apologies. Um, he, has, he is currently the interim dean at Texas A&M College of Law. Um, and for those of you who were skeptical about this, this we have an actual lawyer from Texas A&M. That's only, it's a, I'm sorry, it's a bad joke. My, <laughs> my, my wife is a, a, went to University of Texas and there's a kind of a rivalry. She said, I had to get, there you go. So you, you can appreciate this. So there's a somewhat of a rivalry. She wanted me to tell a Texas Aggie joke. That was my best shot at it. <laughs> um, anyway, te interim dean at Texas A&M, a, a long-standing um, law professor. Um, before joining Texas A&M in 2016, he spent um, at least a decade more, I think, um, at University of Wisconsin Law. Um, also served as an associate professor at DePaul University. Um, he was a fe research fellow at the American Bar Foundation, a faculty fellow at the University of Chicago Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture. He's widely published. Uh, I'll give you just a sampling of the titles of his articles um, on, from his webpage that reflect the, the nature and, uh, of his work and his commitment to justice. Restoring Hope for Heirs, Property Owners, the Uniform Partition of Heirs Property Act, an issue I know he'll touch on tonight. Growing Inequality and Racial Economic Gaps, another article, Forced Sale Risk, Class Race and the Double Discount, and Destabilizing the Normalization of Rural Black Land Loss, a Critical Role for Legal Empiricism. He's won awards such as the Elizabeth Herlock Beckman Award, um, which recognizes transformational educators um, for a small, um, for a, really a small number of faculty who are outstanding in that regard. He's won the Spirit of Land Rich Award, um, and uh, which is uh, presented by the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill for his work on behalf of minority landowners. And he was, as he'll discuss tonight, uh, has been the principal drafter on the Uniform Law Commission 
for the Uniform Partition of Heirs Property Act. He has an LLM from the University of Wisconsin, a JD from Howard, and his bachelor's just down the street from Amherst. It is my great pleasure to welcome Thomas Mitchell to the podium. Howdy. That's an A&M joke. Sorry. A at Texas A&M, the first word out of your mouth at any gathering has to be howdy. Uh, I made the mistake at our 1L orientation this year of, you know, in a, actually in the Fort Worth stockyards, trying to quiet people down and said, you know, shh, we're about to get ready. And like 50 people yelled out, the first word out of your mouth is howdy. Uh, anyway, so it's nice to not be <laughs> in that environment. So I let my hair. <laughs> um, so anyway, it's just it's really great to be to be uh, here for a lot of reasons. I, in some ways, kind of feel at home. I did go to college in Western Massachusetts, and I, I think maybe I spent one time in Vermont. I mean, it was it was either you know football or rugby, some game, but I don't remember a whole lot of it. Uh, it was the mid 80s, uh, but also it's also nice to to be here to um, reconnect with Professor Melissa Scanlon. Where are you, Melissa? She's yeah. Okay, so we kind of go back to our Wisconsin days. My uh, as I was coming up here today, the very first person I met right outside the law school. Uh, this is going to surprise you guys because I know you know him as an introvert. Um, this guy named Jameson, Jameson, right. um, and within two minutes, I know his life story. I know, I mean, um, and then he shares that he was a football player at the University of Wisconsin, so uh, another Wisconsin connection. Uh, since I've moved to Texas, I haven't had good cheese, and all of a sudden, there's, there's cheese, so uh, it was wonderful. So anyway, uh, in seriousness, I want to uh, also kind of thank some folks I've gotten to know just, just recently. So I've gotten to know uh, Professor Mears. We had a really nice talk out in San Diego as we were talking about uh, this presentation. Um, Dean Nolan, it's uh, wonderful to get to know you and, and your work. Um, so this is a very just wonderful community you have, and thank you for inviting me um, into it. So what I'm going to focus on tonight is, is uh, the title of my presentation is a, how to address racial disparity in property ownership. Um, and I'll just, uh, full disclosure, you know, I do do some work in, in land use. The core of my work is in property. I think some of the themes I'm talking tonight are kind of cross-cutting, right? So we already kind of uh, mentioned in terms of uh, the work of Norman Williams um, in, uh, in, in land use issues, right? Um, and obviously the one of the most seminal cases uh, with the intersection of race and kind of uh, and land use, right? Uh, all right, so let me just uh, kind of get started. So just one thing in terms of uh, trying to work to address social justice issues, racial issues in the area of kind of property and land use often is notoriously difficult. So in, if you look at a lot of our kind of the basic areas of the law that you'll study certainly as kind of 1Ls and, and 2Ls, property law is kind of well known for being a area of law that in some ways is, is the least amenable or one of the least amenables to change. So I ended up finding this quote from this intermediate court of appeal in the state of Ohio that talked about, that said, you know, that there, there is reform in the area of kind of uh, property law, but it's, uh, it's the slow evolution of property law, which is somewhat comparable to geologic change. Um, if you then kind of map onto that, work in the area of civil rights. So civil rights often is kind of a, is, is a hard struggle, is a long climb, right? So you, you got property, you got civil rights, and within the area of civil rights, it's often 
uh, stated that addressing kind of housing and real estate and property issues is especially difficult. So in my work with the kind of families and property owners I work um, with, um, and I work with a broad section, not just folks who are from uh, historically subordinated groups, so let me say that. Um, but, but some of the difficulty is that these are folks who are at a disadvantage. They're at a disadvantage economically, they're at a disadvantage politically, and they're at a disadvantage in terms of their networks of the people they know, what we talk about is kind of social capital. Conversely, those who are often in a position to <laughs> um, you know, those who are actually often in a position to effectuate change, those with kind of economic, political, and social capital often are somewhat unfamiliar with the kind of lived experiences and, and the experiences of kind of uh, racial minorities in terms of how they experience the law, including in real property law. Okay, so just um, in terms of some of the kind of foundations of my work, I kind of got interested when I was doing a LLM um, in the mid 90s. Uh, I kind of got interested in the history of ownership, property ownership within the African American community. So just a couple things. I think most folks have heard of the phrase of 40 acres and a mule, which refers to the broken promise that the federal government made to um, slaves who had been emancipated at the end of the Civil War. So, so a lot of folks know about that history. What, what some folks don't uh, appreciate is that between the end of the Civil War and about 1910 and 1920, African Americans actually acquired ownership of between 16 and 19 million acres of land, mostly, mostly through private purchase. Um, and in, in my research, I've kind of focused on the uh, th this aspect of my research is the substantial amount of the loss of that land base, right? Um, so when I was initially kind of doing some studies, it, uh, if you look at just the agricultural census, it was showing in the early 2000s that that land base was down to about a million acres of land. Uh, a more hopeful kind of study that the USA, USDA did uh, in 99, kind of demonstrated it was more like seven and a half million uh, acres of land. But then part of that loss of land has contributed to what we see in this country. I mean, we were, we're experiencing, we're in, we're in the state of Vermont, so you guys are familiar with there. There's somebody, I think, in Burlington who talks about kind of economic inequality. He has a job in DC. Um, but but we're seeing increasing inequalities in our society, both in terms of income and wealth. But when you look at it through a kind of a racial lens, the racial wealth gap in this country is enormous and it's getting bigger, right? So just in, uh, you know, in 2016 data, it showed that the white wealth, black wealth ratio is 10 to one. So we have, you know, there's, there's significant racial income uh, inequalities, but the wealth gap is even more profound. Uh, so this is just kind of some data on what comparing median household um, wealth in white families to black families. And certainly this, this, this story I've told of this uh, loss of property, loss of uh, ownership has contributed to that wealth gap. Um, and I'll talk about that in a second. Oops. So just in terms of some causes of this, I mean, so there's obviously some uh, uh, non-legal causes. So at the end of the, uh, you know, uh, Civil War, the early uh, uh, 20th century, um, African-American families who acquired property were often seen as a threat in terms of their ability to participate in a robust way in society, which was considered a threat. Um, so a lot of that land was lost through violence and intimidation. Obviously, we have patterns of northern migration, so there, there was uh, obviously some of, the, some of that land that was voluntarily sold. But even when it was voluntarily sold, something we saw, uh, whether it's in the earliest 20th century or to this day, is oftentimes you have 
um, some degrees of financial illiteracy within um, uh, minority communities, and often the land that they voluntarily sell often is is below its actual market value. Um, what I've kind of focused is on some involuntary legal processes, right? So we have, is, is, is everybody here a lawyer? Or almost everybody? Okay, 90%? All right, so, you know, the law students, you all finished your property, or you still haven't, you know, but, okay, we've heard of adverse possession. Oh, okay, okay. You've heard of eminent domain? Oh, okay. Uh, tax sales, maybe yes, maybe no, foreclosure. And what, and what I'll focus on is, is partition sales. So this is just for the, one, for the three L's. You remember that common ownership, uh, concurrent ownership, we call it, joint tenancies. And all right, excellent. Very heartening. Um, so I'll talk about the aspect of land loss that was attributable to these partition sales which is a forced sale of property owned concurrently. Um, all right, so the, so let me make sure I didn't advance, yeah. So in my research, I ended up discovering that there was this term called heirs property. And this was when I was doing my LLM at Wisconsin in the late 90s. I was working with this um, amazing center called the Land Tenure Center that focused on kind of land policy. It had done work mostly internationally, um, but then in the late 90s, it got some funding to be begin a domestic program. And I was kind of an eager uh, master's LLM student, and I, uh, from, I had worked in Washington, D.C. for several years, and my friends in D.C. who were not lawyers, but they did international development work, kept telling me about this land tenure center. So when I arrived in Madison in 96, I immediately made a beeline to the land tenure center. It turned out the director was a lawyer, although he was the only lawyer, and I just basically embedded myself and started volunteering. Um, and one of the things that they asked me to do was to make a series of kind of trips to the rural south to meet with a variety of uh, minority property owners and farmers. Um, and I was at a meeting, I was in North Carolina, where this was uh, when they were settling this in incredibly seminal, important class action lawsuit that African American farmers had filed against the United States Department of Agriculture. Uh, it's called Pigford versus Glickman. It's actually the largest civil rights settlement in U.S. history. Um, and these, so I thought, because it was in the New York Times and it was on uh, 60 Minutes, and, and they were kind of telling this really wonderful story. And I was actually surprised when I went to the meeting how many of these farmers were mad about what they thought was the poor amount of the sell sell settlement. But then some family started talking to me about this heirs property thing, and I had never heard the term. And so essentially I figured out that it was tenancy and common property. Um, and then they would tell me these stories that they would have, uh, you know, there'd be 20, 30, 40, 50 family members who jointly, commonly own this property, and how real estate speculators were preying upon these families or picking out one of the family members, typically somebody who had been a, uh, a relative in a northern state in Chicago, Detroit, who uh, was third generation, who had never seen the property, um, and they'd buy that person's 2% interest out, also for actually well below that its value, and then they would, with that toehold, they would then go to the local state court and request the court to order the property forcibly sold. Right? Um, and so I'm hearing this, never heard about this when I was in law school. I don't remember any property textbook talking about this. And frankly, my attitude was, um, wow, it's sad how unsophisticated these people are, because certainly that's not how property law works the way I was taught. Um, but I told these families, hey, listen, I'll go, I'll go back to Madison, and I'll do some research, and I'll kind of get back to you thinking, right, um, it's kind of sad. And somehow when I got back, I ended up um, doing some additional research that was kind of difficult to do, but then it actually validated the claims of these families, um, and that became the topic of my thesis. Um, okay, so in, in the African-American community, this, is, this type of ownership is very prevalent. It's prevalent because essentially in the United States, poor people don't make wills. So if you look at the overall rate of uh, will-making in this country, 
It's about 58, 59%. But when you correct for in terms of people's education and income, um, it goes way down. But even even the the highest rate of intestacy in this country, though, so that's when you don't make a will and your property passes down. The highest rate in the white community is 42%, and those are for white Americans who um, just have a high school degree, right? And so that's the highest rate of intestacy, 42%. If you look in the African American community, um, the lowest rate of intestacy, in other words, the group that has the greatest amount of will making is African Americans who are the most educated. African Americans who have both a college degree and some type of professional degree or a college degree and a graduate degree. And the rate of intestacy within that demographic, right, this is the best in the African American is 67%. Um, and so you can see why this, this uh, form of property that oftentimes results from pass property passing from one generation to the next by intestacy is high within the African American uh, community. And then the problem with, with these families, and I run into families all the time of different educational levels, um, is that the default rules governing tenancy in common ownership are oftentimes counterintuitive. So a lot of times these families think, oh, it's great that there's 40, 50 heirs, because they assume for the property to be sold, there has to be unanimity, like everybody has to agree. And it turns out it's just the opposite, right? With the greater number of tenants in common, um, each one of those tenants, tenants in common could initiate a partition action requesting a sale. All right, so just, just, to, just kind of, so, so my work focuses on one aspect. I mean, one part of my work is that this unstable and insecure ownership um, but there's other problems with heirs property uh, generally. It's, it's hard to manage. It's hard to, because oftentimes to do some fundamental things with the property, you have to have unanimous uh, agreement, and that's tough to get. Uh, there's problems with folks who are lacking clear title. This really came to light in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans. So Hurricane Katrina revealed that there was a huge percentage of heirs property in New Orleans to qualify for the federal funds. It was a program the federal government designed called the Road Home where people could get reimbursement for their destroyed property um, or they could get money to, re, uh, to fix their properties. But that required people to demonstrate that they had clear title. When you have heirs property, the property often passes down from one generation to another without any establishment of who are the common owners. Um, and that ended up being a significant bar to, for families who had heirs property in New Orleans to access the uh, funds that were ma made available under the Road Home Program. All right, so once again, my uh, focus and some of my scholarship on uh, heirs property and, and uh, partition uh, does have to do with this unstable uh, feature. So in my first article um, on this, this was uh, an article I had published in the Northwestern University Law Review. Just, it's, it's, you know, your first article. It's, the title's too long. It's got semicolons with more stuff. <laughs> I was trying to do a lot in that title. <laughs> so I'll just call it the From Reconstruction to Deconstruction article, although it has about 12 more words. Um, and. You know, one of the things in that article um, was that I had a final section that had to do with my ideas for proposed reforms. And I took seriously, that's actually one of the reasons, main reasons I became a law professor, is um, I wanted to do a variety of things. I wanted to teach students. I wanted to publish scholarships. But I wanted to have a bigger impact. Um, and. Um, and so I came up with, you know, five or six ideas. They were well elaborated. Um, and let me tell you the feedback I got. Um, so I sent out the article. In the old days, I actually physically mailed it <laughs> to a variety of leading law professors across the country to get their feedback as I was finalizing it. And I'd say, you know, pretty much the universal uh, impression was that 
wow, great article. Um, folks liked it. They said, you know, I was demonstrating my mastery of property law. It was very interdisciplinary in terms of drawing on history and sociology and anthropology. Some folks liked that. Um, but then I kept having comments about my last section, my proposed reforms. And essentially what it boiled down to was that uh, the comment was, I see that you spent a lot of time on this section. Um, you do know that none of these reforms will ever happen. And it's a sad fact you're dealing with people who lack political, economic, and social capital. Um, so you're just going to be hitting your head against the wall. So stop wasting your time. There was also a comment that, let me help you understand as a young law professor how you make your way in the world in legal academia. You churn out articles. The amount of time you spent on that last section could have been an article in and of itself, another line on the CV. Um, so there was some of that advice too, right? Then you had, um, around the time my Northwestern article came out, you have these very two distinguished um, property scholars, Hannah Dagan, very nice guy, Michael Heller at Columbia. They kind of, their article was similar in some ways to mine, but when they were kind of looking at this phenomenon of partition law and how it was contributing to the loss of African-American owned land, they made this comment, right? Um, so they, they basically were just using this example of partition of African-American land to make a different point about common ownership generally in other forms. Uh, but then they kind of go on to say that, just, just right here, right? Um, that um, we're not saying that if the law in this area was reformed in any way that it would actually have any different impact, right? And the effects of poverty and race discrimination have been such that black farmers would likely have been done out of their land, you know, by loan sharks and other scam artists, even if the law of co-ownership had been more favorable, right? So their point is, what's the point, right, of even bothering to reform the law? These people would have their law, their land and their property taken anyway, right? Okay, so I guess we come at, we, we view the world differently, um, and I kind of, that quote right there, um, let me put it this way, it motivated me uh, to, to, to continue the struggle. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, that, I mean, I didn't need that quote, but uh, it helped me, right? So how do we go from having an area of law, right? You know, we're talking tenancy and common ownership. This goes back to the English common. We're talking about hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years of law um, that seems that it's not amenable to reform, right? And so how do you go from a situation where you saw what was kind of the uh, received wisdom about whether or not this area was amenable to reform, and the answer was no, right, to kind of cracking open the door a little bit and having maybe there's a small possibility of reform to actual reform in this area, right? So I think I wanted, so that's kind of a little bit when, when David and I were talking in San Diego, a little bit of what I wanted to share with you, as opposed to just having a presentation about uh, another piece of scholarship and uh, a purely legal, was kind of, kind of panning out and saying, as somebody who was interested in trying to reform the law, what was the strategy that I used working in conjunction with others to, to, to accomplish something that was seen as something that could not be accomplished, right? So I think one of the central things was that in, in, in this kind of reform effort, we used a very comprehensive approach. We, there was a legal strategy, right? So there was this scholarship on tenancy and common ownership and partition and um, and, and really kind of challenging some assumptions about how the law operates, how it should operate. Um, you know, so there was, there was a lot of time, you know, doing legal research and writing and scholarship. Um, but we combined that also with, with some non-legal um, elements. So in some ways, some people refer to me as kind of an engaged scholar, right? Um, and, and one of those things is, yes, I do the scholarship. Um, 
But early on in my career, and this, this came from working with that land tenure center, um, I got involved with them in building a program that placed law students to spend their summers working on behalf of uh, disadvantaged property owners, mostly in rural communities, but not as the program developed, not exclusively. Um, and so the issue was they were trying to help these, these, these disadvantaged property owners who lacked access to legal services and that lack of access to legal services fundamentally contributed to their, in many instances, losing their property. All right, so, you know, I, I kind of built up this program. Ultimately, we had, you know, 10, 11, 12 placement sites um, in the Southeast working on behalf of African Americans, on uh, Native American reservations, on the Texas-Mexico border in, in an area they called the Colonias, um, and in uh, Appalachia and places like Eastern Kentucky, right? But through these placement sites, I got to know all these uh, public interest law firms, community-based organizations, legal aid organizations, who had spent decades working on this issue and had a very granular understanding and fine-tuned understanding of the specific issues these communities were facing in terms of how they were interacting with the property law. Um, I became a, I, I helped some of these organizations write grants. Um, and then I got involved with the American Bar Association's um, real property and trust in the state law section. All right, so that having both the kind of doing the scholarship, but also through my research and uh, my service work, getting to know all of these organizations that had been in the trenches. Um, and a lot of these were nonprofits who were, their very survival <laughs> from year to year was not certain. Um, just, just kind of gave me this network. And then there was serendipity, right? So one of the things I realized is, especially in trying to do this social justice work, that it's almost necessary to have a media strategy. Okay, we didn't have a media strategy, we lucked into. It turns out that, so it was the late 90s, uh, I, as I mentioned before, there was this uh, landmark class action lawsuit brought by African-American farmers, which was kind of like the hot thing at the time for the day. It was for like a six month period. Like I said, it was front page Washington Post, New York Times, uh, 60 minutes. And we got lucky, it turns out there were a couple of reporters at the Associated Press who uh, got interested in the idea of not just African-American farmers, but African-American landowners and wanted to know what the history was. And they got funding from AP to spend six months in a number of southern states interviewing hundreds and hundreds of hundreds of uh, individuals and families about what their uh, property ownership issues were. Well, lucky for me, one of the things they stumbled upon as a uh, significant driver of land loss was partition sales of tenancy and common property. So when I had been working on my thesis, I had been kind of working in the deep backwaters of property law at the time. That wasn't considered a sexy topic. I, I know that's gonna be shocking to you. Um, and let me tell you one, I, I worked at a large law firm in Washington, D.C., Covington and Burling. And when I was leaving the firm to do this LLM program at Wisconsin, one of the partners asked me, so, so what are you gonna be doing? I said, oh, I'm gonna go to the University of Wisconsin to do this program called the Hasty Fellowship Program where I'm gonna study the property problems of African Americans in the rural South. Um, and his comment to me was, uh, Thomas, uh, that's what we call burnout, and that's what we call career suicide. Um, so what you need to do is go to a Caribbean island and hang out for like a month, <laughs> you know, come back with your batteries recharged and make more appropriate career decisions. Uh, I'm kind of a hard head. Uh, I decided to, you know, get in my, you know, U-Haul um, and drive to Wisconsin. But the whole time there, I was thinking, like, wow, could I have picked a more remote <laughs> area of property law to study? Um, why am I interested in this? But all of a sudden, the AP calls, and because I had been toiling in that field. All of a sudden, I was Thomas Mitchell, natural, national expert, uh, is what the AP article said. Um, anyway, but the, but the point was, what I've learned going forward is, is I would advise people to actually, in an affirmative, 
planned way, think about a media strategy, we lucked into one. Um, and that had a vast uh, and, and amazing impact. I mean, so it was because of the AP article that the ABA got interested, formed this task force, asked me to be on the task force, um, and that's what happened. The other thing is, is, and this kind of comes back to networks again, is, is the importance in this area of having what I call a uh, bottom-up and a top-down strategy. And then I'll talk to you a little bit about, okay, we go from, you know, uh, hopeless area of the law, nobody's gonna care, what's the point, ABA gets interested, uh, we get the Uniform Law Commission to, to accept our proposal to develop an act. So then we actually have an act, and I'm, then I'll tell you a little bit about what we've done when we've gone to states trying to get them to enact it into law. And what I'll tell you is, and we can have a discussion about this, is there's a difference between the scholarship of people like me in terms of how we address the problem and how we talk to members of state legislatures <laughs> about the problem. Uh, and so we can talk about that. Okay, so just a couple of things when I say, you know, this is kind of my example of kind of an engaged scholar. So this was one of my Wisconsin students who did a, that externship, um, and this is in a, one of the poorest counties in eastern North Carolina in a city called Tillery. Um, and so she was working with families as part of her work during the summer who did not have wills helping them draft wills for their family. Um, and so, and then through this work, one of the organizations I got to know is an organization called the Federation of Southern Cooperatives. And there's the woman on the right is a woman named Shirley Sherrod, who I got to know when she worked at the Federation. Does anybody, does that name ring a bell? Clinton administration, she was the director of the USDA's rural development for the state of Georgia. There's a uh, media company called Breitbart. Um, and they basically say that she had been caught on tape saying that the only people she wanted to help was black families and she wouldn't help white families who were struggling. Turns out that Breitbart had edited the tape to uh, take out some key words where she was said, what she really said was in addition to helping black families, she was happy to help white families. Um, anyway, so I got to know Shirley before all that. Um, Okay, so um, just in terms of like when I talk about having this kind of bottom up and top down strategy, so let me focus on, I, I mentioned to you that I was working with some of the leadership in the ABA's real property and trust and state law section. Um, we did write a proposal. So we had, we had in addressing this issue, we had uh, come up with a three prong strategy to try to help these families. One of them is like kind of in the wheelhouse of the ABA. Um, is to sponsor continuing legal education uh, workshops. And essentially with that part of our strategy, we were, most CLEs, most pro bono work in firms typically is done by litigators to a much reduced extent by transactional lawyers like tax lawyers and real estate lawyers. Essentially we were trying to convince uh, lawyers in mid-sized to large law firms who are transactional lawyers to work with these families to try to help them make wills, reorganize their property uh, from a tenancy in common to something more stable like an LLC. Uh, and that's something that the ABA is, that's bread and butter for them is to sponsor like CLEs. The second strategy we had was to essentially take my summer externship program and, can, and have one law school in the South uh, develop a clinic that would work with these families on a variety of their real estate and tax um, and uh, kind of entity formation issues. Um, so we, I knew we could do the CLEs with this idea of this, of this uh, clinic. The only kicker with that is we needed money. Uh, and I thought that was like a 50-50. Um, and then the ABA came up with like $135,000 of seed money and then we were able to convince the University of North Carolina Law School to uh, found this kind of clinic. So I'm, so I'm feeling good at this point. Our most ambitious strategy was to write a proposal to an organization called the Uniform Law Commission, also known as the National 
Conference of Commissioners on Uniform State Laws. So I want you guys to be honest. If I said the Uniform Law Commission, how many of you would, could raise your hand and say you know what I'm talking about? Okay. If I said the National Conference of Commissioners on Uniform State Laws, the same people? Okay. So don't feel bad, law students. Um, when I first uh, was asked to make some presentations at various law schools after I had gotten appointed to be the reporter, the principal drafter for Uniform Mag, one of my first talks was at the University of Kansas. So I'm just talking, and I start my talk about, you know, uh, what we were doing with the, uh, so the, they used to call it NACUSL, was like the initials. So, you know, with the National Conference Commission on Uniform State Laws, I'm, I'm just like assuming they know what that means, and I start telling them about, and I realize I'm looking at law professors and 90% of them like have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, I had to remember before I got selected to be the drafter, I didn't know what the Uniform Law Commission was, right? Um, but anyway, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's an organization that uh, is, consists of you know, 250, 300 of these people called Uniform Law Commissioners. They're all appointed by governors. Um, and even though most of you don't, are not familiar with the organization, if I mention some of their, like, well, their most famous product, uh, so has anybody heard of the Uniform Commercial Code, the UCC? All right, so they did the UCC along with the American Law Institute, ALI. And in 125 years, they've developed 350 uniform acts, which are, I tell like the lay people, like think model state statute. Um, that's what a uniform act is essentially. Although the Uniform Law Commission would kill me if I just said, if they know I just said that. All right, so they have this amazing group of talented lawyers. Um, these are people with tons of social capital. Um, I mean, in the area of property law, one of the most prominent is actually here in Vermont. He's got a practice in Burlington. His name's Carl Lisman. I think he's a graduate of this law school, maybe. I don't, I, th I think he mentioned that. Um, and so on their uniform law projects, um, they get a ton of proposals in every year, but then they only select four or five. So I'm working on this ABA committee, the Property Preservation Task Force. Um, we're feeling good that we got the CLEs, we got the clinic funded, and then we figured we'll, we'll write a proposal to the Uniform Law Commission. But to be honest with you, we spent 18 months working on the proposal, knowing that they only would accept four or five. When I looked at the history of the Uniform Acts that they had undertaken, um, there wasn't anything like ours um, that was specifically getting to the core of dealing with some issues in terms of kind of racial inequalities, uh, discrimination. And so, you know, we'd have these, I don't know, monthly conference calls and somebody would always start it off by saying, hey, you know, do you think we have a 5% chance or a 10% chance that when we sit my, submit our proposal, they're gonna accept it? Um, but we felt obligated to do it. You know, we were gonna do it. They were gonna deny it. We would check the box that we tried and then we would move on to something else, right? That was kind of like the thinking. Um, and I remember it was February 2007, the uh, executive director of the Uniform Law Commission is based in Chicago, calls me in my office in Madison and tells me that your act is, was one of the four or five selected and I literally almost fell out of my chair. Uh, fast forward to April of that year, I get another call from him and um, he asked me to be the reporter, which is the principal drafter. And I also almost fall out of my chair. Um, but anyway, so I, as I mentioned, they, they, these commissioners, since they're all appointed by governors, they're very prominent people. They include judges, they include members of the state legislature like Carl, uh, leading private uh, transactional attorneys or attorneys. Um, and they're able to draw upon their network uh, to, in many instances, get things enacted into law. And working with ULC is, is not only do they have a drafting committee, that, that's the one that we, you know, we met for three years, there were six meetings all around the country, but then they have an operation that tries to get their uniform acts enacted into law, um, which is a huge benefit. And if you can draw on that network and get one or two, there's kind of a bandwagon effect sometimes, it can increase the possibility that other states will enact it into law. All right. Um, so that's kind of some, what we, I'll just say like, very elite lawyers, 
um, very kind of connected people, which is helpful in terms of their networks. In dealing with our kind of issue, though, it was also important to have a bottom-up strategy, right? So as I mentioned on that first, uh, one of my first slides, is one of the problems that in this area is oftentimes it's those the elite uh, people, lawyers, who live a totally different life than folks who are disadvantaged. So like when I talk to Carl, he, you know, I mean, he's this na nationally respected real estate attorney, um, and he had never heard about this problem, right? Because that's just not the story of his family, that's not the story of his clients. And so to have people at the table who actually knew about the lived experiences and how the law impacted these uh, folks was, was key. Um, and so we were, um, you know, so, the, so that doesn't often in the, in this, uh, in the uniform law processes, you oftentimes don't see these kind of grassroots folks at the table. Even if they wanted to be at the table, there's what I call the cost of playing the game. Uh, and that's, I mean, I literally mean it. I said we were at six meetings uh, all over the country, usually in a four or five star hotel or fancy resort. Um, and you gotta have the travel money to get there. You gotta now, um, and if you don't have that, you can't play the game. Um, and then also you have to have folks who get some education on how the uniform law process and procedures work. Right, so you can imagine if most of you guys had never even heard of this organization, well now think about it if you are in, you know, rural Louisiana or Mississippi, um, and um, you're just working in the trenches, what's the chances that you really know about these procedures? So one of the things that was just incredible is that this organization, as I mentioned to you, I, in working with these, um, when I was building up this externship program, I got to know all these organizations. One of the things that was interesting about these organizations is that, um, and this is not uncommon in the nonprofit world, as I described, many of these organizations, they've been in the trenches, their survival's not assured, they, the various organizations are usually applying for the same type of funding and grants from the federal government, state government, private foundations. And so what happened over time was many of these organizations didn't see themselves as working together and having esprit de corps. They saw each other as competitors and then things had kind of gotten a little nasty, even though they basically had the same mission, right? And so what was wonderful is that this coalition ends up forming. Um, and it was actually, it's the reason actually I won one of my awards. It was a former student who had participated in the externship program. He was actually a law student from Northeastern Law School from Long Island, from a wealthy family. And he ended up spending the summer in like rural North Carolina being exposed to these families and just something about that lit a fire um, with him that he's been pursuing ever since. Um, he ends up moving to uh, Alabama after he graduates from law school and begins to work um, in any way he can with these, uh, on this issue and with these families. And maybe because he was an outsider, he was able to get all these public interest law firms, legal aid, whatever, organizations that had not had any history of working together and kind of convince them that on this one project of trying to reform partition law where there was no money at the table, they weren't gonna be fighting over that, that they could work together. And, and he just did an amazing job of, of pulling them together. Um, and then in the process of drafting the act, there were many times in the three year period where we were meeting where we would be debating uh, some language and the problem was that, once again, these are mostly disadvantaged families own property. There's kind of a social science phenomenon we talk about as a litigation pyramid. So oftentimes the cases that you see in your textbooks, we have to then think from a social science perspective, can we generalize from those cases? Are they broadly representative or not? And in some ways, in many areas of the law, the cases that get reported are not representative because it doesn't take into account the people who don't have the resources to participate in the legal system, or if they do, they're only participating at the lowest level, right? 
they're not having their cases appealed because they can't afford that. And it was because of these organizations that spent all these decades working with these families, they often had a much better sense about how the law was actually being applied to them uh, in very specific ways. And so it would, we'd often stop the meeting and say, okay, tell us, Land Loss Prevention Project, North Carolina, what happens in this case? And that really then informed how we drafted that, the language that we drafted. One of the interesting things, though, was that I had worked very hard to try to convince the, uh, this coalition to participate in the process, right? Now, I didn't have money for, for them. Luckily, they applied for a grant with the Southern Poverty Law Center, which gave them the money to travel to these various drafting sessions. Um, but initially, one of the problems was that they saw, when they heard that I got appointed as a principal drafter, they were elated, they were celebrating, they were like, we've got our guy <laughs> in the inside. And one of the things I had to let them know was that as somebody who's uh, not a uniform law commissioner, right, so oftentimes they'll pick a rep the reporter or the principal drafter is actually a member of the Uniform Law Commission. So I was like, I'm not a member of the Uniform Law Commission um, and it's 125 or 26 years uh, and as I indicated, uh, you know, 350 uniform acts. And on the biggies like the UCC, they'll have multiple reporters. So let's just say for sake of argument, there has been 400 reporters in the history of the ULC. Um, what I had to let these folks know is I'm just the second African-American ever to serve in that role. So I'm an outsider. I'm just the second African-American. If you think I'm going to walk into that room with these incredibly elite lawyers and just you know, have my Louisville slugger and tell them how things are going to go down, <laughs> you're naive, right? And so essentially what I told them was this could play out in one of two ways. You guys do not participate in the process. I'm there alone. And if it's that case, here's how it's going to play out. I'm going to pick three issues, and we're going to play less on, on and I'll, I'll, I'll fight to the mat on those issues. But on everything else, I'm going to be playing let's make a deal. Or you guys could choose to decide to participate and be at the table while we're working out the language. Um, and I, happily, they chose <laughs> option B. Like, um, but what, what was, so, I, so we're at the first drafting meeting, um, in Chicago, and I think I've orchestrated this, you know, in a way that nobody knew in the room, except for the for the people who were from the heirs' property retention. I'm feeling very proud of myself, right? I'm like, okay, I'm the new, I'm not the commissioner, whatever, but I got this, I've all engineered this other thing, <laughs> um, and I could just be quiet sometimes, and all of a sudden they can spontaneously participate robustly, you know, and be great advocates. So. We're in this meeting, uh, the, the, the first drafting session, and in the very first half an hour of the drafting session, there's a professor who I've become friends with now. He's at George Mason. But essentially, he was trying to um, take down the whole reform effort and argue that we should close up shop. Um, that reform in this area wasn't needed, um, that if we actually proceeded with drafting a uniform act, which he advised against, that it should be incredibly narrow. So he came up with uh, some criteria that the reform of partition law should only apply, and I'll give you some of the bullet points, to families that owned their property for four generations, to land that wasn't just rural land but was farmland, and to farmland that had earned no income for the families for 20 years. Um, and I'm thinking, well, that will be cute. That might help 10 families in the country. Um, but I don't have to say anything because these advocates are going to pounce. Um, now, you know, George Mason is known for law and economics. So in his presentation, he threw, out, threw around a lot of law and economics terminology. I mean, I know it. But it totally intimidated these uh, grassroots folks. And to my horror, they sat there looking shocked and intimidated, and they were silent, um, which meant that I then had to burn up precious political capital, which really had me hot. Um, and I told them that at the first bathroom break. Um, and so to their, to their great credit, though, you know what they did is that 
they realized that they were a little bit in over their heads in terms of kind of the social environment. Um, this was not their milieu. <laughs> And they then contacted Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law in DC. And I don't know if anybody's familiar with Lawyers Committee, but oftentimes what they'll do is identify a partner at a large law firm to represent some group pro bono. And that's what they did. And there ended up being a leading partner at, uh, when, they, when he joined, he was at DLA Piper, which is the I don't know, second largest law firm in the world. They have one of the most robust real estate practices. Um, he then subsequently, in the drafting process, moved. And it was amazing, because the second drafting meeting was in Tucson, Arizona. And so they come now with Greg Peterson from DLA Piper. And, you know, it, 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 was, it was just amazing to watch, right? So Greg has the same background as all these uniform law commissioners. And so it, they become very clubby. They go to the same clubs. Um, I mean, socially, they just interact, right? And then in the course of that drafting weekend, Greg actually, you know, he has tons of real estate expertise, but on some points he made, he made the exact same points that the grassroots folks tried to make at the Chicago meeting, and they were rebuffed. And then when he made those, and the words were coming out of his mouth, all of a sudden, you know, the commissioners were like shaking their head, like, of course, yeah. Uh, and it was just kind of amazing to watch that. Um, all right, so let me tell you just a few things, um, and so this will be the, um, you know, the 1L property, uh, you know, kind of, I mean, some of you guys are still going, but you guys have already done concurrent ownership, right? All right, so this is like a review, right? And for the 3Ls who uh, don't remember <laughs> the difference between, this will be a real review. Anyway, so I, I think of the act as I, having, it has a lot of bells and whistles, but three big points or three big provisions. And a lot of these were informed by essentially one of our um, operating methodologies was we were trying to look how wealthier families with access to attorneys structure their common ownership. And we tried to provide some of those same protections uh, for these families. So one of the things um, that, that we said is, uh, you know, I mentioned that example where you'll have a real estate speculator buys out a family member who's got a 2% interest. Um, so what we said was when, if that happens, the other family members who want to maintain ownership of the property then have the right, exclusive right, to buy out that speculator or the person who's seeking a forced sale for the fair market value of their 2%. Right. Um, somebody, one of the commissioners from Connecticut referred to that as shark repellent. Um, all right. So the, I don't want to get in the weeds, but sometimes like either families won't have the money for a buyout or the buyout won't resolve the action. And so does anybody, this is like, for, I'll, just, I'll just take one else here. So if a court's going to order in a partition action, what are the two major remedies that a court can order? Yeah, partition in kind or partition by sale. Partition by sale being the forced sale. Excellent. Um, so most of the state law says that the partition in kind is the preferred remedy because that's the more con that's the remedy that's more consistent with preserving property rights, as opposed to having your property forcibly sold and then you get the some of the revenue from the sale. All right, so that's what the most statutes say in the majority of states, but the majority of states then don't set up any criteria. So what had happened in over the course of several decades is a lot of state court judges, common law judges, then filled the gap. So they took what was supposed to be a preference for a physical division of the property, preserving property rights, and kind of effectively flipped it on its head and said that, um, that a partition in kind would only be favored if it was wealth maximizing. That if the ordering a forced sale would generate more money than what the value of the land that would be allotted in a partition in kind, it should be, uh, that should be the uh, remedy. So essentially it made the forced sale effectively the preferred remedy. 
So what we did in, in, our, in the Uniform Act was said, we said no. We said when state statutes say that the partition in kind is the preferred remedy, like we mean that. And what we're going to do is add substance to the preference by developing specific criteria that the courts have to make findings about. So some of the findings would, you know, would be, uh, was there evidence of long-standing ownership within the family of the property at issue? Would selling the property render one of the co-tenants homeless who was using the property for basic shelter? There was some economic stuff. We, were, we did say, well, if it, is it wealth maximizing to order a sale? Um, is, uh, is the person who's asking for the sale the uh, co-tenant who's actually been paying all the property taxes, right, and taking on that burden? But we had a mix of factors, right, but it was trying to add substance to the, uh, to that, uh, to the preference for the partition in kind, which is more consistent with preserving property rights. And then the third thing we said was that in those instances where a court would order, order a sale, and we said we could imagine a lot of situations where that would be the preferred remedy. Though I started talking about black farmers and rural land, heirs property, tenancy and common property that passes by intestacy is not a rural phenomenon or an urban phenomenon. It's a disadvantaged and poor phenomenon. And so oftentimes you could have a single family home owned um, in Burlington, owned in Atlanta, owned in St. Louis, that passes down. Uh, you got 40 or 50 heirs, there's a dispute, um, and somebody wants a forced sale. Well, it's, it's gonna be really hard to divide that house up in a way that would be meaningful, right? So that'd be an example where you would have a, um, uh, a forced sale, the partition sale might make sense. But in, in one of my articles that uh, Professor Mears referenced is one of the th one of the things I had pointed out was that I kind of um, looked at kind of some of the law and economics claims about some of these sales, the claims that they were wealth maximizing, and kind of, I think very convincingly, of course, um, put the lie to that and indicated that, no, most of these fail sales, if you look at the state procedures that are laid out in state statutes about how the uh, property should be sold, they're not being sold under conditions that mirror uh, a sale uh, that under fair market value conditions. The sale is often ordered, the property is often ordered sold in 10 days. It, in many places, only has to be advertised once in the legal section of the newspaper, and I don't know how many of you read that section. Um, and so, often when you talk to these families, the property was, it's a forced sale. It's not a sale under fair market value conditions. So we were, so we ended up saying, it. well, if one of the goals of a sale, of these for sale, is to maximize wealth, you should have a sales procedure in place that's designed to vindicate that goal. Um, I couldn't initially find, one of the things when you're the reporter is you, the principal drafter, is you have to do a 50-state survey of the law that you're looking at changing in every issue. And initially, I couldn't find any example of uh, a statutory provision or courts ordering a sale under kind of these more fair market value kind of conditions, um, which was a problem in the drafting process, actually. So once again, we were at the Tucson meeting, and the Uniform Law Commission has a rule. And the rule is for any proposed reform of the law, at a minimum, you need to demonstrate that at least one state already has that provision in law. And it's a pragmatic thing. They don't want to spend this 80,000 and then tens of thousands of additional dollars trying to enact something in the law if there's almost no probability that it will be enacted in law. I mean, there's not a single state that has that provision. That's a pretty strong indicator that it will likely fail, right? This is especially hard in the area of property law. So in all of the substantive areas that the Uniform Law Commission has worked on, they've had the least amount of success with respect to their uniform acts addressing real property or real estate. Um, 
So I'll just tell you on this, the, uh, I'll ask a question. So you have to know the difference between a median and a mean, but what is the median number of states, uh, what are the median number of enactments of the Uniform Law Commission's portfolio of real property acts? So what's the median number of, of state enactments for if you look at all of their uniform real property acts in the last 126 years. Okay, the punchline is zero. <laughs> so that means most of them have utterly failed, right? And so already we're dealing in the area of real property. And then I've got a sales procedure that I can't, I wanna change it and I can't find a single state that has this, what I think of as this better Right, and that's a requirement because the Uniform Law Commission gives you this like this uh, procedures manual when you get appointed as the reporter. So do, what do I do? What do you think I do? I, I, I basically cannot meet their basic standard. Do I throw in the towel? Good. Um, so I decide to think outside the box a little bit and I decide, you know what? I'm just not prepared to fold the tent. I can't comply with their basic. But if you think about this area of law, we got this from England. It's going to be in other countries where, like in the Commonwealth countries. So I'm going to start doing a little bit of selective international comparative research on tenancy and common ownership. And I'm going to see what I'm going to come up with. Now, I've got to pick countries that are going to be um, influential to this kind of elite group of people. So that meant you know, England, Australia, New Zealand, Canada. Um, and I kind of, so that was my thinking. Let me, let me see if I can find some other authority. And either one of two things is going to happen. Either um, the sales procedure they have in these other countries is just as bad as here. And then I had a silver lining to that. And then that will become the basis of my research for the international comparative law of tenancy and common ownership. And I will have already gotten some initial research done. But I said, maybe I'll find something. And it turns out I ended up finding something in Scotland. Uh, they actually had a case in the Scottish highest court in about 1972 where they came up with a different sales procedure. And then I found that half of the provinces in Canada had this other procedure. So I go into that Tucson meeting, and now I'm being an advocate. Uh, we come to that part, and they want to know what my authority is. And I say, first of all, I tell them what the policy objectives are, right? We want to maximize wealth, and we need a sales procedure that's done. And then I say, and I cite the Scottish High Court case, and I cite the five or six provinces in Canada, and I mentioned I think Australia also had a different sales procedure. Uh, and then I wrap it up by saying, of course, if, that's, if we want to vindicate the policy goal, we need to um, have a procedure that's similar to what we have in these other countries. You know, and I say that as, a, as it's obvious, right? Once again, I'm thinking internally, uh, I got about a 5% chance. Um, and one of the people uh, in the room raises his hand, and I had just met him for the first time. He hadn't come to the first drafting meeting in, in Chicago. And the evening before, uh, at the dinner, he told me, somehow in the conversation he mentioned that, he's from Midland, Texas, and he mentions, oh, well, well, when George and Laura are in Midland, they stay at my house, like George and Laura Bush, for anybody who didn't get that. And I'm thinking, when he raised his hand, okay, I tried, uh, but it's not gonna prevail. And then he said, you know, let's go back to the policy goals. And the policy goal, as Thomas indicated, is wealth maximization. And he said, initially, when I was reviewing the draft of this, I had never seen a procedure like this in the United States. But if you think about the policy goals, this procedure would actually vindicate those goals. And then it passed, uh, which I was amazed. So all right. Um, so let me, I, let, let me, I have the last two slides. I'm sure I've talked too long at this point. Um, so let me tell you where we are. I think in the, um, the marketing material announcing this, we had said that there were 10 states that had enacted this into law. Um, so that's been shocking, right? I, I've told you that the median number of these uh, uniform real property acts is zero. Now we have a uniform act that's dealing with race and disadvantaged people. So you would think that this would be like below zero. Um, 
And, you know, I told the, uh, and I, you know, uh, maybe I'll, in conversation afterwards, I'll let you know that in the three years we drafted the act, there were three attempts within the committee to kill the act. Because uh, they thought it was just going to be a loser. And they didn't want another loser on their books, right? In the context, we were at our last drafting meeting in New Orleans. And I was trying to be very gracious and thank, you know, folks. Um, but I was a little annoyed that there had been these three attempts to kill the act. And I did say something like, if we even get one state to enact this into law, I'm claiming complete and total victory. Um, we got Nevada coming out of the box because one of the uniform law commissioners is very effective in Nevada. Uh, but the, one of the biggest surprises, as I think you'll see the map, is uh, maybe I'll just show you the map and stop talking. All right, so as you can see this map, uh, five of the states that have enacted this into law are southern states, which really has taken a lot of us by surprise. Texas became the most recent southern state uh, when Governor Abdit signed it into law last uh, in May of 2017. Um, when I was talking to David, I had mentioned that there were 10 states. Yesterday, the governor of Iowa signed it into law. So now we have 11 states. Um, and then just, how do I, I want to get out of this. All right, I think the, uh, I want to just talk about South Carolina for a second. Then I have like last slide, it's kind of like what I call my reflections on this work I've done with, along with many others. So for me, South Carolina really um, is, is an amazing story. As I mentioned to you, you guys had heard about 40 acres and a mule, uh, that the federal government abandoned that promise. But what's true is that in South Carolina, when that policy was announced, there ended up being several African-American families who basically staked out their claim to land. And more so than in almost any other state, and even when the, the U.S. government abandoned that commitment, there were a group of families that basically said, no, we're not getting off the land. Um, and there was this subset that the government just said, it's not worth it, and let them kind of keep the land. So South Carolina represents the state in this country where you have the highest number of African-American landowners. So to get the act enacted in South Carolina was huge in and of itself. But so I'm going to tell you, when you look at these votes in the southern states, which mirrors the votes outside the South, what's amazing is not only have we gotten it enacted into law, there's been almost no opposition, right? So I think among the five southern states, I mean, I'm talking in the state House of Representatives and the state Senates in these five states, like, so we've got 10 chambers. I think five people have voted against it, like, in the aggregate. And so that might make it seem like, oh, yeah, it was just rolling through. Um, so let me tell you about South Carolina. So South Carolina, um, I uh, testified, I think it was now three years ago, um, in the House Judiciary Committee. So I kind of go, I test, it's a subcommittee of the Judiciary Committee. They vote eight to nothing to support the act. As I'm leaving the committee room, one of the representatives tell me, tells me, you're good. When you get a vote like this out of the subcommittee, the Judiciary Committee as a whole is gonna follow, and then the House will follow the Judiciary Committee. So at that point, you know, I shake everybody's hands, I just had one last thing I wanted to do on my way to the airport is stop right in front of the Capitol, take a picture with the Confederate flag to show my friends, um, and then I go home. I'm at a conference uh, about 10 days later at the University of Georgia in Athens, Georgia, and I get an email late in the afternoon, and this is about two weeks before the legislative session's gonna end. And they said, um, unfortunately, Thomas, uh, there's been a hiccup in, um, in the House, in the Judiciary Committee. A real estate, uh, an important real estate developer has gotten to the chair of the Judiciary Committee, and he's putting a permanent hold on it, and he's gonna strangle it, and it's not gonna come up for a vote. 
Um, and so he says that it's too bad because if it passed, it would have done great things, but you know, that's that. Okay, so I, I get that, and I immediately, when I get back to Madison, I decide, no. Um, it's probably gonna die, but it's not gonna die without a fight. So I, and so, but what can I do? I just start trying to throw Hail Mary passes. So Hail Mary meant like, I need to talk to some pretty important people in South Carolina quick and in a hurry, right? So I, I don't know South Carolina, uh, but I know that they got a South Carolina bar, uh, you know, association. So I, I go on the website, I call the president, he doesn't return my phone call. I call the vice president, she doesn't return my phone call. None of them return my phone call. I thought of, there's some law professors that I tried to call, and that didn't really pan out. Um, and then I don't, you know, and I thought, oh, you know, these uh, uh, bar associations, they all have like a board of directors. So then I found their board of directors, and I, you know, decided to go, you know, who's the chair, who's the, and the first person I called was this prominent uh, attorney who was the chair of the South Carolina Bar Association, who actually was very familiar with this problem of heirs' property and very sympathetic. And he basically said, I will try to get um, a prominent real estate attorney who could ask for a meeting with the chair of the Judiciary Committee. I can't promise anything, time is tight. Um, you know, so four or five days goes by and I get a call uh, that says on a Saturday afternoon, he actually met with, the, 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 he identified some real, prominent real estate attorney who did meet with the chair of the Judiciary Committee and the guy released his hold. So now we got five days before the end of the session. So I'm checking every single day. Monday goes by, no action. Tuesday, you get it. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Um, and so it's Friday. And it's their session concluded at 5 p.m. And at 4.15, uh, they voted on it uh, unanimously. So we, we get that passed. But you get, okay, wait, wait. okay. Hold it, the more dramatic thing is gonna be the next year. So you have two years in South Carolina to pass a bill into law. So we were able to bank our win in the South Carolina House. And then the next legislative session, we were gonna you know, put all our efforts with the Senate. Same thing. Uh, I'm getting reports, everything's great. Uh, you know, it's, it's kind of zipping along. Don't see any hurdles. And then all of a sudden in like March, I get a phone call. And they said, we got a problem. Um, Problem here was that they said two right-wing senators all of a sudden in, in, in the hearing started voicing opposition. They said one more than the other. And so they said, Thomas, could here's the six issues that they, that they raised. Could you write a letter addressing each one of them? And then it'll be disseminated to the entire Judiciary Committee. So of course I do that. Turns out one of the state senators is convinced by my arguments and he decides he's not gonna oppose it but we got this other one. Um, this other one is a guy named Senator Paul Thurmond. Senator Paul Thurmond has a daddy, or had a daddy. Um, and his daddy was named Strom Thurmond. Um, and uh, so then I felt like I was battling the ghost of Strom Thurmond, who was trying to kill my back. And this is, you know, what I'm gonna tell you now is both kind of, um, I, I have real mixed emotions about it, um, it's tragic in one way, but there's a silver lining, at least in the area that I work in. In response to Senator Thurman's attempt to kill the act, you know, um, the state senator who sponsored the act, at the last of the 11th hour, decided to rename the act. So in every state that it's passed, it's called the Uniform Partition of Heirs Property Act. There had been a state senator in South Carolina who had been the champion for heirs property owners uh, during his entire time in the South Carolina legislature, first in the House, then in the Senate. And his name was Clemente C. Pinckney. So do y'all remember that massacre in that church in Charleston at Mother Emanuel Church? The reverend, the pastor was Clemente C. Pinckney who was also in the state Senate. So the state, uh, the center sponsor at the last minute renamed the act. So in South Carolina, it's called the Clemente C. Pinckney Uniform Partition of Heirs Property Act. And essentially by renaming the act, they threw down the gauntlet and said, you know, who of you besides Paul Thurman will have the guts to vote against the one piece of legislation named in honor of Clemente Pinckney? And it turned out 
except for uh, 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 Paul Thurmond. Right, so what seems like an easy victory, um, you know, behind the scenes, it's, it wasn't as easy. So let me just end on this. Um, as kind of as I've kind of reflected on my work in kind of the area of kind of property or land use, um, in terms of trying to have an impact, try to uh, have the law work in, in a way that would be helpful to disadvantaged families um, who disproportionately have been African Americans or people of color. Um, I mean, one of the points I always make to my law students is law is always susceptible to change. Now, sometimes negatively, but sometimes positively, right? Um, and if that, if, if, People who of goodwill and who are committed to social justice are not willing to enter the fray and fight, then nothing will happen. As part of that, you have to be resilient and you gotta be creative. So I kind of gave you some examples of things I did in this process, whether it's drawing on international comparative law, <laughs> kind of secretly organizing this group of uh, you know, advocates. Um, and then one of the things I think both in my scholarship and both in terms of actual, um, actual reforming the law that I've realized that is really powerful is the importance of how you frame an issue and the narratives. So one of the things that other folks who had written about kind of heirs property ownership kept talking about African American property owners or landowners as being on the brink of extinction, right? Now, part of it is they didn't have access to, or they weren't paying attention to some more fine-grained, granular kind of data, right? So they were looking at the ag census that showed that there was a million acres of agricultural land, but there was this other study that I said showed that there was more like seven and a half million um, that I knew about, um, especially with some of my work with some sociologists and anthropologists. And so when we were working with the Uniform Law Commission, one of our threshold issues was that when they're considering an act, they got, you have to show that it'll have an impact. Well, if you're talking about that the people you're trying to impact are extinct, well, it's too late. So I had to kind of push back and said, no, they're not extinct. I mean, their numbers are down, but reform of the law in this area could still have a substantial positive impact. All right, so that was kind of one thing in terms of just uh, meeting the basic requirements that, the, that they would draft an act that would have some meaning. The second, okay, this is what I, I, I kind of previewed at the beginning, is when we've talked to st state legislators, right? So, you know, you saw that, uh, you know, South Carolina, Alabama, Texas, Arkansas, Georgia, uh, you know, I told you I've testified in some of these legislator, uh, legislatures. Um, so what do you think I lead with? when I am talking in these legislatures. You think I'm talking about some of the history I've told you? Uh, you think I'm talking about 40 acres and a mule? Exactly. So what I talk about repeatedly is that this act fundamentally is about protecting private property rights and preserving real estate wealth. Um, when I testified in Texas last spring, I mean, in some ways I, I do feel conflicted about that, to be honest, um, but I think I repeated those phrases seven or eight times. And if you saw the lineup of the legislators I was talking to, um, it was kind of a murderer's row in terms of folks who have not historically been identified as being sympathetic to you know, economic inequality, <laughs> racial justice. Um, and, you know, uh, so that, that's something that I, I'm, uh, it's always interesting me when I'm not playing law professor and I'm playing like, you know, uh, trying to get legislative reform is these different narratives and the different ways of framing. All right, and so just, uh, and one other comment is that, you know, and this is like a comment with law professors and law students is that, you know, I think what we really need to focus is making sure that apart from any expertise in any substantive area, what we're really honing is critical thinking skills. And I'll tell you why I say this. Before the law was, has been changing, when I was teaching property law to uh, my 1L students and we were looking at the cases and the 
textbook, which were kind of making the partition sale like the default, I'd have students just nodding along, and then I'd try to like engage them and talk about well, what policies are at stake, what are we trying to vindicate, what theories. And it was the power that it was in black and white in a textbook, and some court had said that, is that that was just became the default for a lot of my students. And then I said, well, let's imagine some other ways this law could operate. And they're, they were so stuck in the default. What's interesting now is I teach my <laughs> property students now, and a lot of textbooks now are covering the Uniform Act. And so, and then, you know, they'll talk about that, and so they'll see that in the textbook, and I'm like, well, what do you think about that? And they're like, oh, that totally makes sense, <laughs> right? And it's, uh, it's the power that it's in the book, right? But the point is that if there hadn't been a group of us who had looked at what the law was, the, the predominant law before, and then actually questioned it, right, we wouldn't have reform. Um, okay, th and the, the last thing I kind of think about is, um, you know, it's a good story um, how we were able to get reform in this area of property law that had been seemingly uh, not amenable to reform. It's kind of one of those against all the odds stories, and there's some value into that. But, but increasingly over time, I mean, I'm happy with that story, right? But what I've begun to think is, can this be generative? Can this be a model that can be replicated, right, um, to address other issues in terms of that disadvantaged and racial minorities and subordinated groups are facing in terms of what seems to be intractable legal problems that they face? And I think that there are some lessons Right, so some of the, what I told you at the beginning about having a comprehensive legal and non-legal strategy, a media strategy, um, working with a bottom-up and a top-down, I think those are elements that could be drawn upon to address some of these other challenges um, in a useful way. But I say yes, but. And what I totally do recognize is that even though this issue that uh, I had worked on, some others had worked on for years, always was talked about, or, or most predominantly was talked about in the legal scholarship as a racial justice issue. Um, it turns out it was an issue that, if you looked at it from a slightly dis different angle, you could frame it differently. And what I fully acknowledge is, there are a whole host of kind of racial justice issues that cannot be reframed in the way that we were able to reframe ours. So I, you know, out of some humility, that's why I say, yes, there are a lot of things in terms of like the methodology of how we approach this problem that would be uh, fruit for discussion uh, or food for thought or it could be thought about as maybe being replicated in different form. But I want to still want to be, you know, honest, and say, but not everywhere. Um, all right. So I'm sure I've talked half an hour too long. <laughs> and I so apologize for that. But uh, let me conclude now and just thank you for listening so attentively. Actually, let me use, let me show yours. Yes, sir. We've got a microphone. 
think whenever, in any state that we've worked on, uh, when we have kind of affirmatively decided to try to uh, get it enacted in a particular state, one of the things that we've learned is that we really have to do the groundwork and identify witnesses and, um, and then, one of the things that happened in, in the Virgin Islands is that some eager member of the legislature just introduced it without us having had the opportunity to identify people and, and identify the scope of the problem. Um, but anyway, I, I would suspect that this is an issue. I, I don't want to say definitively, um, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's an issue in Puerto Rico. Hello, uh, thank you very much for the inspiring talk. Um, what were, what were some of the strongest um, opposition arguments from the real estate industry or mm -hmm. other industries, mm -hmm. and how did you overcome it? And you mentioned um, the reframing of the issue as protecting real estate, uh, real estate wealth and property rights. Mm -hmm. Could you give us a glimpse of like what the one minute spiel that you would mm -hmm. give mm -hmm. sounds like? Yeah, um, all right. So it was interesting that we had imagined that there was going to be this robust opposition. And we had imagined, like, there's an organization called the International Association for Shopping Center Developers. And we had come up with all kinds of other um, organizations that we thought were going to come. And actually, I used that when I recruited the grassroots people, because I essentially said, well, here's going to be who, here's who will be at the table, and if you're not there. A lot of that didn't materialize. Um, and I think that even among organizations that represent real estate developers, these types of practices are considered unseemly, sharp, and I don't think that they wanted to put their organizational reputational capital at risk by defending this. Uh, so that imagined opposition by these organizations representing developers or speculators didn't material materialize. Where we have run into problems um, in a couple of states is essentially two groups. Practicing lawyers. So we had, there was an attempt to enact our, uh, introduce our act in Maine. And then there ended up being a prominent real estate attorney in Portland, Maine, who handles partition cases, who was active in Maine's uh, real property section of their state bar and he basically single-handedly killed it because um, he saw it as intruding on his business. So that's, there's been a couple states where we've faced that. Um, and that's pretty, you know, you're talking about just raw, pure economic interest. Um, the other group that, that we've had um, some issues with is the judiciary. So in, and actually some like administrative folks so the, um, initially in South Carolina, some of the judges didn't like this because they saw it as taking away discretion when we said that, for example, they had to make these specific findings in deciding whether to have partition in kind versus partition sale. They didn't like that, right? Because it was taking away their discretion. Um, you know, we had some very delicate discussions through different channels with some state judges to try to calm them down. Um, and, um, you know, we ended up prevailing in a couple of states. It actually, in Tennessee this, um, this session, it unanimously passed the Tennessee Senate, but in the Tennessee House, it was judges. So next year, we're going to have to engage with state judges in Tennessee. Um, there are also some there, uh, uh, clerks of the court, because some of the procedures now we're requiring them to people to um, uh, file a variety of things that they didn't have to file before in a partition action, right? Um, so there's a whole procedure that at the beginning of the action, if the property uh, satisfies the definition of heirs property, um, there has to be a valuation of the property and there has to be appraisals filed and the clerks were like, that never happened before, that sounds like more work. Um, you know, so in, you know, I, I, once again, that came in South Carolina. So in South Carolina, we ended up shifting the burden away from the like court clerks. We found a way to appease them and put more of the onus on the parties. So, I mean, it's, it's not what you kind of, exp 
I could see with the real estate lawyers, right, that um, I would not have thought like uh, the state organization of court clerks um, was going to be mad about increased workload, but that is an issue we face. Oh, wait, okay. Hi, I'm Oliver Goodenough. I'm, I'm one of the professors here. I'd like to lead off with a with a, a, a shout out to a former colleague of ours here, Faith Rivers, whose work you are undoubtedly aware of. She was on our faculty here yep. for a while and I was um, a, certainly was responsible for introducing me to initially to this concept. Yeah. Um, then uh, we've got a lot of folks in property classes here. Uh, you've said you know this could be a model. What would be the next? piece to attack in your mm -hmm. estimation? If you had to say, okay, here's my next one, sure. where would that be? Okay, so this, this heirs property problem has, a, you know, I said there's this variety of issues, right? There's the, um, there's that issue of the for sale, so what we're trying to do is bolster the ability of these families to maintain their property. Um, but an, one of the other big problems is that um, and I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, if you own property in this common ownership form, to have any kind of substantial action you do with the property requires, in most instances, unanimous support among all the common owners, among all the co-tenants, right? Um, so for example, if you, um, so I've told you that under the default rules, this is the most unstable form of real property common ownership in the United States. Well. Families who have legal resources, um, who are organizing their common ownership, um, often decide, okay, we're gonna organize our, th our property into an LLC, but if there's a better entity that comes along, we'll then change it to this entity. And usually you don't have to have 100% agreement. Um, and so oftentimes these families are locked in because there is this rule of 100% for any of these substantial. So I've said, well, why are we locking these families into this dysfunctional ownership? Um, why couldn't we have a rule that if a supermajority of the interest owners wanted to, whatever, uh, reform to an LLC or um, agree to use their property in a certain way? So that's one thing that I've thought about is, is examining uh, to somewhat dilute this rule of 100% agreement, which often then renders any, agree uh, any change or agreement impossible. So. Well, thank you. Sorry. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I just, as we conclude, I want to just make sure I call out uh, Becca Miloszewski. I forgot, failed to thank her earlier on, but she's responsible for pulling all the logistics of this together. A round of applause for Becca. Thank you, Professor Mitchell. Thanks to all of you. Have a good evening.